Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're excited to once again interview Saga Maria Sandberg. Saga Maria grew up roaming the forests surrounding her family's farm in Sweden. And on part one of this podcast, we learned about her remarkable works of art, which have been described as authentic, beguiling, captivating, and perhaps above all, a beautifully curated celebration of Sweden's natural systems. So go listen to part one and learn more about her amazing artwork. But here on part two, we're going to take a deeper dive into the vast realm of Swedish history, folklore, and myth. That means a trip through time and space to learn about the histories of the infamous Vikings, some of the indigenous tribes of Scandinavia, like the Sami, and we'll even step through the veil into the mystical realm of the Vasen, where we'll meet trolls, witches, and even mushrooms. Saga Maria will be our way shower and shine some light on how these myths, legends, and vestiges of ancient culture still influence our world today. Saga Maria, thank you once again for coming on the show. Thank you for having me again. I'm well, super pumped about this subject. <laughs> I can tell you're very passionate. You sent me loads of information. So I have been down the Norse Swedish rabbit hole. And I have to say, I love it. And I may make this rabbit hole my new home because there's so much interesting material to cover. And I think that it was clear from our last conversation, this warranted its own podcast because there was so much to talk about and you have such an intimate knowledge. So I'm excited to get into it. Awesome. Huge, just a super vast subject, really. Since people still believe in these things, kind of, a lot of it has made their way to our modern society. You know, like it's the knowledge is still so intact. So there's so much. <laughs> because not only do some of the things we're going to talk about still play a big role in Swedish culture and Scandinavian culture, but we were talking before the show on how much this infuses into Anglican culture and kind of English and American culture, and we may not even realize it. That was one of the things that stood out to me as the most fascinating because we don't think about those kind of Swedish and Scandi roots to some parts of our culture. To get us started, I did want to talk about some of the indigenous peoples of Scandinavia, just a little bit to differentiate that from kind of the Norse culture that most Americans or most people associate with Sweden today, that was actually not the first culture there in Sweden. No, it wasn't. So, I mean, almost at the same time, if you look at from a very like high, far off perspective, Scandinavia was populated by the Sami, people and then shortly thereafter by the the celtic tribes that arrived to scandinavia so the sami people they arrived in scandinavia through uh, through russia and then a little bit later the germanic people came from the south so the sami people they have populated <laughs> is that what you said there uh, yes the most northern part of Scandinavia. So they still have their territory up there, which goes through Norway, Sweden, Finland, and a bit of Russia. There's so much to say about the Sami people. There's just so much to say. They have such a rich folklore of their own with loads of gods and, and loads of spirits. And I mean, goodness, it's such a big subject. So I hope that one day you will have uh, someone from the Sami people. To, <laughs> to guide your listeners through their way of life, which is super fascinating and wonderful. In this particular podcast, I guess we will try to narrow it down a bit and we'll talk about some spiritual things that ties into mushrooms. And the Samic people, they have been practicing shamanism, which is a common thing from like the polar people. Yeah. You know, like the, the Russians and the Inuits. We often hear tales of the Siberian uh, mushroom shaman when you hear folklore around the Amanita muscaria and that kind of thing. So there does seem to be this yeah, for real shaman tradition that had some kind of relationship with mushrooms. Yes. So the Sami, even though they aren't directly related to the Siberian shamans, 
the practice reminds a bit of their yeah. in a different way, in their own fantastically unique way. For the Sami, the shaman was very important and in each village, in each settlement, or in each family even, would have their shaman to carry out their shamanic rituals, which was a, a normal part of their life. They had one ritual which involves a mushroom, which um, is a bracket mushroom. They would use this bracket mushroom for healing rituals. They would collect the bracket mushrooms, and these are the same ones we talked about in the, the previous podcast, which was um, very, very important for Scandinavian culture. So they would collect these bracket mushrooms, and they would dry them, and they would lit them on fire, kind of like incense, to purify. They would lit, lit them on fire, and if you had some kind of ailment, or maybe a wound or something, they the shaman would use the mushroom to draw out the sickness from your body by either placing some of the burning mushroom on on the place of illness or on the person or they would put it on like a tree stump or a rock next to the person to try to make whatever evil spirits or whatever sickness that was plaguing them to travel to the mushroom instead wow a very spiritual relationship with the mushroom. And I think the fact that every family or, you know, every group of people had a shaman hints at the fact that these indigenous Sami had a very rich spiritual life and spiritual tradition. And like you said, that's a deep tapestry, a, a big world to get into all on its own. But I just wanted to differentiate that from Norse culture and just show that there is this indigenous backdrop in Sweden and throughout really it sounds like the polar regions not just Sweden mm, it goes yeah. through Scandinavia and Russia and I just wanted to appreciate that and set that background for people but that is a huge topic unto itself and who knows we may one day have to do a part three or we may have to find some way to integrate a breakdown of the of the Sami and really an examination of the various tribes and as you said many languages uh, so, oh, yeah, yeah. And one really interesting point to wrap that up. You did say that their way of life was largely unchanged up until pretty recent history. Yes, it was. I mean, still today, many of the Sami people carry out the traditional lifestyle. But yeah, I mean, until the 1920s, most of the, the tribes were still living traditionally the way they've always done. Sadly, they had to, uh, when the Inquisition hit Europe during the 1600s, you know, the, there was many waves of Inquisitions. Mm -hmm. It reached Scandinavia and it reached the Sami culture. So they had to um, give up a lot of their ways. Otherwise, they would be punished. But they would still carry them out in secrecy, of course. But much of it was, was then carried out like behind the hidden... <laughs> it just it drove made. it underground. And the bracket fungus yeah. you were talking about, was that the same uh, fomentarius that we've discussed all the uses of uh, before? Exactly. The, the oh, famous Scandinavian beloved so you, bracket you just, fungi. You could use it for <laughs> tinder, you could use it for making hats, you could use it for bandages, and you could even use it as a spiritual aid to get rid of evil spirits. Goodness, yes. The... Snuske, as we call it, it was used for absolutely everything. Poor, poor shroom. <laughs> <laughs> the Fenisca had to do a lot of work in ancient culture for the people. Yeah, it did. <laughs> so moving then into Norse culture, the culture of, among other things, the Vikings of Odin and Thor and all those things we associate with it. I want to dive into that world and see where we can, their relationship with mushrooms, maybe tease out some of these amazing influences that this culture has had on our modern culture. Why don't we start a little bit with a backdrop of who were the Norse or who were the peoples that brought in the Norse culture into Sweden and Scandinavia? Imagine Scandinavia like 2000 years ago, the wild nature, the deep real woods, the hundreds of thousands of dark lakes, the long dark winters, and the short but intense summer with its white nights. The people there were dependent on the land for survival, and through their close relationship with nature, this rich, rich folklore sprung. 
So for us Scandinavians, the Vikings, they were the people who went on raids, who traveled to trade or who colonized foreign lands. The rest of the Scandinavian people, they led peaceful lives on the countryside. So, and it's about Vikings, they meant the same people as you do, the people who traveled far and who traded or raided. So the folklore before and after the Viking Age changed very little as the people who stayed behind carried on as usual, you know, plus minus a few gods that sh showed up for a couple of hundred years. We're talking about Odin or Thor here. And then the Christian god who came and sort of went, sorry, <laughs> sorry Christians <laughs> listening. The folklore stays still the same because people still had the same relationship to nature. That's an important distinction because for me growing up, when you talked Scandinavia, ancient Scandinavian culture, when you talked about the Norse, you were talking about the Vikings. That was what it meant. Everyone was this kind of big lumbering warrior who went out on their ships and raided the coastlines through poor England or wherever else. <laughs> but you've kind of illuminated the fact that, no, that was one subset of people you know, these were just the people we might consider traitors or maybe pirates or, you know, it mm. was just a small yes. part of the culture that, of these seafarers. Yes, exactly. The ordinary, let's say, Scandinavian people, they would also call them, oh, the Vikings. You know, they would either be like, oh, the horror or, oh, the Vikings, you know, you can go to trade. So during the Viking Age, there was Viking villages that sprung up and these villages were centered around trading. The most famous one is the Birka village on an island outside Stockholm, which was a village that sprung up around the trading. So the Vikings, they would go further down into Europe to trade, all the way down to the Roman Empire, to Rome itself even, to trade. And then they would come back to Birka with all these things that they have traded, which could be like a very impressive array of things. Lots of, lots of Middle Eastern jewelry and things from China. It's amazing. So they would bring these back to Birka and there they would trade with other northerners like the Finns and the Russians, the Germans, other seafarers would come there to trade. So this was a typical Viking village, meaning that it existed only during the Viking Age. It was born because of the Vikings and then later the village died because the Viking era was over and people didn't go on raids anymore. So it's super, super cool. <laughs> now, the subset of traditions and the belief systems that caused the formation of this group of Viking people, was that something where they were taking part of Norse culture and creating their own gods or belief systems that caused them to be more courageous and go out into the world? Or, you know, as this subset of culture that changed Scandinavian and Swedish culture at the time so much to where there were big villages that eventually went away or disappeared. What caused the change and caused them to come forth and what maybe led to them disappearing? So it's believed that the Vikings picked up their Viking religion, which we call the Asatru, which are the gods of Thor and Odin and things that the, the Marvel <laughs> Marvel superhero thingy has has made uh, popular and mainstream. Right, so people know about this now. Anyhow, they picked them up in in northern Germany, and they carried this religion with them and turned it into their own version, you could say. And this took on like a wildfire during the Viking Age. The Asatru was the biggest thing. That's what you believed in. And as you say, a lot of these myths and these gods they definitely helped to power up the Vikings. Yeah. It went well into the lifestyle, you know, of these powerful gods that would be on your side if you would sacrifice this or that or if you do that. I mean, it just went so well <laughs> with the, the pirate lifestyle. And later, when the Vikings became more and more of a problem because they became more and more numerous and at the same time, Christianity got a better hold of Europe, Many traders stopped trading with the Vikings, even though like we had these epicenters for trading in Scandinavia who were run by the Vikings. Later, Christians, good Christians, would refuse to trade with the Vikings because of their religion. In that way, you know, if you can't trade, what are you going to live from if you're a Viking? You know, so 
slowly Christianity started to creep into Scandinavia as well. It never had a, quite a strong hold of Scandinavia as it had of the rest of Europe. Because, I mean, it's, it's hard to control Scandinavia in a way because it's so much land and su such little population. It's hard to reach everyone with everything. That's when the Viking era started to fizzle out a bit. And many Vikings had to become Christians in order to be able to trade. Now their influence carries through. I mean, you just referenced Marvel, but the influence of this Viking culture carries through to today in so many ways, even just in language, a uh, question I had was, does Asatru, does that still have adherence in Sweden and Scandinavia? Do people still kind of use that robust spiritual tradition today? There's still people practicing Asatru, yes. And sadly, Asatru here is the equivalent of like far right wing fundamentalist Christians in America. Uh, okay, but, so maybe not the most popular uh, types of people that pick up that tradition. No, sadly not. So you have that group of people, you know, because they are what you call purists. They want to go yeah. back to the roots. Yeah. Okay. That makes some people hesitant to, um, what's it called, to confess that they are a follower of that because right, right. they don't want to get mixed in it with that bunch, if you know what I mean. A, a guilt so, by association. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I grew up on the countryside and it was very common amongst young men to have the Thor's hammer. You know, Thor's hammer is a, it's a jewelry worn by young men. And it was just, it was so common. Like most guys in my class would wear it. It's a symbol of, of strength and like iron will. And it's something that you would gather power from. Thor's and power would, <laughs> will help you. Prevail. And, <laughs> and you're gathering power from ancient ancestors. I'm always impressed with any culture that carries through a spiritual tradition for that long that then when you tap into it, you're tapping into such an ancient lineage of all the people that have worshipped it. It's like this instant touchstone to the past. And I do want to get more into then, you know, what pagan rituals, I don't even know if that's the right word to use, but what pagan rituals still survive in Sweden today? Like you said, Christianity did not take hold the way there that it did in other places. But before we leave Vikings, I do want to talk about some of the words and some of the influences that we get today. And I guess what better place to start than my instant association with the Vikings, which is Berserk or Berserker. Oh God, Berserkers were so cool. So the <laughs> word Berserk or Berserk, it means bear is the, the animal bear and serk means clothing so it means bear clothing so a berserker means like a bear skin like someone who wears the bear skin and this was actually pre-viking age because you know you had warriors oh okay I mean, any country needs warriors right so pre-viking age you would have these the things you worshipped were more like nature and animals Right. So the bear has always been a symbol of strength, you know, before, for example, Thor entered the stage. And if you needed strength, you would worship Thor. But before that, you would worship the bear. So the bear berserker or the bear warrior, they were a specific type of warrior that would wear a bear skin. And they had a specific lifestyle as well, because they were the most fearsome of all warriors. Because if you are the warrior of strength i mean scary <laughs> if you're gonna if you're gonna embody the energy of a bear you better be really strong and scary and brave and all those things right so i mean they had uh, they had their own culture and they were seen as some of the top of society the people. elites yeah exactly the the kings and the jarls they would employ berserkers as their the guards they were so renowned and berserkers, they would have a hierarchy among themselves, depending on how many bears you've killed and how many foes you have killed. So a young berserker, he would look much less refined than a more experienced berserker. So for example, younger berserkers, they would wear their uh, hair very long and their beard very long. 
they were supposed to be like more scruffy looking. And then the more foes you would kill and the more bears you would kill, you would cut your beard each time. So if you didn't have any hair or any beard as a berserker, you know that you were the most fearsome. That explains my scruffiness. I haven't killed any foes or Uh, bears, so I'm still very scruffy. Is there any truth to the myth or the folklore that the berserkers ate Amanita muscaria mushrooms prior to their battles? Because that's a big folklore that's out there, is that all these crazy berserkers, these big, strong, scary warriors would eat the Amanita muscaria, and that would put them into this daze, this fury that would make them go out and fight. Is that is there any truth to that? Wow, this is a super good topic, because... No one really knows where this myth started, but it's pretty modern. No old books talking about it. So. No old stone carvings of a warrior holding a mushroom. Nope. Or nope, yeah. nope, 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 nope. So I think it's it's a bit mixed up. There's a fact that the berserkers, they would drink a spiced mead, specific spiced mead, before going into their legendary rage stage. Because when they were on the battlefield or when they were going to fight, a part of being a berserker is, is working up a huge rage. So you would be completely fearless on the battlefield. So yeah. they would drink a spiced mead before that. And the burial rites of the Old Norse and the Scandinavian people were very specific. You would bury a person along with their most prized possessions. And not prized in the way that they are expensive, but they would define who you are. After death, when you would enter the next world, you would have all the stuff you needed to continue to be you, if you know what I mean. So you can tell very easily one grave from another what this person was doing in their life. And this is something you can see at the the Birka Museum, like on the islands of island of Birka, they have a museum today where the Viking uh, village used to be. And uh, they had this big exhibition on graves like what you find in graves and how easy it is to tell like what kind of life this person led so in the berserker grave you would find amongst other stuff you would find the seeds from plants that they believe that they use to make their mead their rage mead so to call but no dried mushrooms so they would usually contain seeds from henbane i don't know if you know what that is i'm not too familiar with henbane I mean, it's pretty common, I think, in many countries of Europe that shamans would use. I've only ever heard of it in a witchy or or shamanic context, and I always just have an association with what it is, but I've never seen it in the wild, and I couldn't tell what plant is a henbane. (laughs) Honestly, me neither. I'm a forager, so I focus on plants that I can eat and not get high from. But apparently, with the right amount of henbane and the right brew, this would drive you a little bit insane. A little temporary insanity helps to build that that rage that the good berserker needs. Yes. Even though they were revered, is that what you say in English, and yep. they were the top of society, they were also very feared among the common folk because sure. they had this bad reputation that when they go into rage, they would kill anyone or anything that stood in their way, friend or foe, kind of. So the common folk were like, they are of reach from these guys. So they weren't trusted very much. And they think that this could have been an effect of the henbane they drank before going into their rage state. So we can attribute that behavior to this henbane, this spice mead, not the Amanita muscaria, no. which from everything I've heard about the Amanita muscaria's effects, it's kind of a delirium, almost a drunkenness. As one famous forager here in the U.S. said, David Aurora, he said, if you had taken an Amanita muscaria, the last thing you would be doing is going on a battlefield. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Absolutely. But I think it's all their things. And I think it's interesting to hear there was no visual artistic evidence of the use of the Amanita muscaria at the time. Actually, you just added a key piece of evidence there where the grave sites they're finding, there aren't dried mushrooms, which you would expect if that was a big part of their culture. So as much as I really liked that myth, Like the idea that they were using that, it just, it's not true. And there's plenty of reasons to think this is cool without needing to involve Omnita Muscaria. They were badass, not with the help of mushrooms, though. (laughs) Well, and the word berserk is 
a Norse word that eventually becomes integrated into our culture as berserker or going berserk. So there's one little uh, evidence of root of Norse language coming into English language even today. And another good example, the Ufhednar. Oh, yeah. The Ulfhednar, which means wolf skin. The Ulfhednar was uh, a warrior who pledged to the wolf. They would channel the strength of the wolf. Something that I find interesting with this is that when I researched this, I found that the, the Native Americans, one of the many, many tribes, of Native Americans, I can't remember which, sorry. The Navajo culture, I believe. Oh, okay, cool. They believed in something called skinwalkers, that a person can wear someone else's skin and become either that person or that animal. And that was a huge part of, um, of the folklore predating the Viking Age. That was a huge part of the folklore that, that you could somehow change your physical form by walking into someone else's skin. And, and this is a whole belief system on its own. The shaman, the Scandinavian shamans, they would try to change their shape. But the warriors, they would try to do it as physically as possible. So the Ulfednar was another one. They would wear the wolf skin to try to sh channel the mighty powers of the wolf. Of course. I mean, you wear the bear skin to become the bear. power of the bear. You wear the wolf skin to have the power of the wolf. It goes hand in hand with having a spiritual tradition where you're thinking of gods that are mighty. So they're kind of doing all this psychologically to build yes. themselves up and then have the physical component where you're actually wearing a bear skin, you're doing brave acts, you're drinking a spiced meat of henbane. So they were really doing everything they could to create an environment where like you were the ultimate warrior. And they were kind of like cults. So the berserkers, they had their culture and the Ulfhednar, they had their culture as well. So the Ulfhednar, they, they would fight in a different kind of way. They wouldn't go into the berserker state. They would use spears, for example like long spears and fight with spears and they would work more as a group like wolves do. In my own understanding, I'm kind of forming this separation between the Asatru, which is the anthropomorphized gods of Thor and Odin, and kind of this other deeper Norse spiritual tradition that is just the worship of nature, which as we learn more and more about cultures around the world, it becomes apparent that the first spiritual traditions, the first religious impulses come from that worship of the natural world. So Scandinavian yes. culture is really interesting to me in that it feels like a lot of that modern nature worship carries through right till today. They haven't had to make analogs for that. Still very much there's a worship of nature that carries through. And it might be part of the reason why Christianity couldn't take hold. Things that didn't tie back to that worship of nature may not have resonated with the Norse people. Yeah, what the Christians had to do here is that they had to interweave pagan rituals into the Christian rituals. So many of the Christian holidays that we have here, they are fake Christian holidays. They're not like carried out in any other country because they're actually pagan. And the Christians, they had to kind of like claim them because they couldn't make people stop practicing it. After a while, they'd be like, don't do that. Ugh. Okay, by the way, guys, we haven't told you this, but this is actually Christian. Keep on doing this thing, but uh, replace the other, like the nature spirits or the Norse gods with God and Jesus instead. Then you can carry on doing it. So we still carry out some pagan things that kind of like in a thin Christian packaging. And, but, and um, you see that too, where Christianity would often build churches on top of sacred sites or you know, sacred stone areas, they would build a church there and they would try to piggyback on these ancient pagan traditions. So I'm really fascinated by the world of the Vasan. And uh, my partner and myself were really into the Volva and the Sade and some of these more magical elements of Swedish culture that are really rich worlds to dive into. Were those directly related to the Vikings? Were those separate uh, traditions or belief systems that maybe predate the Vikings or did they come after the Vikings? They predated the Vikings. Having a shaman was something that's been important for a very long time in the Scandinavian society. Having like access to a shaman who is the person who has access to the spirit world. Right. Because you might want to search guidance from the spirit world and the shaman would be your 
medium to consult in this. So they were quite prominent before the Viking Age and continued to be prominent throughout the Viking Age. But it's, since it was a, a very female profession, it was traditionally carried out by women. Men were very discouraged to do any kind of shaman work. It was done by women, and um, if a man would do it, you would kind of look at him like, oh, what the hell are you up to? And this fact is something that was picked up by the Norse mythology and the Asa Tru. So ah. in the Asa Tru, you have the, the goddess Freya. Freya, she was a vulva, which was what you mentioned. And vulva is the old Scandinavian word, the old Norse word for female shaman. So Freya, she was a, a vulva. And the god Odin, who was the god of wisdom and knowledge, he was very drawn to the, the Valar and the Völva, the ones who did shaman work and, and Seid, which is what we call practicing a trance or speaking to the spiritual world. So according to Norse mythology and folklore, Odin tried shamanism for a while and the other gods they ridiculed him for this because they were like what are you a woman now what are you doing i mean right right you can't be doing this you're a man which is interesting because he was the most respected god of them all and he was not afraid to do this which would seem to be you know embarrassing for men to do does this get at the root of what we call witches today and i will point out that word vulva shows up in english uh, language as obviously an incredibly feminine term. So I wonder if there was some pulling from that origin. And then did this practice, the vulva, the female shaman, did that build into our modern interpretation of the witch? I think you had male witches, so to say, and then you had the female witches down in Celtic tribes. Okay. And the Germanic people, they had this as well. They also had their witches. So I think the modern view of a witch it comes more from the celtic uh, mythology okay. and the celtic settlements and the nordic shamans they are a bit closer i think they borrowed a lot from the, the sami people and the siberian shamans they're closer to them yeah they were probably inexorably influenced by each other but there were kind of these parallel traditions the witch and the vulva, and we probably yes. pull our modern interpretation of a witch more from that uh, southern or, or German context. If I say druid, you don't yeah. think of a witch. You know, no. a mental image of a druid is not someone brewing potions and doing that stuff. They do their druidic stuff. And, and the vulva are more closely connected to druids. They would have long capes. They would uh. have a staff. Because vulva or vala actually means staff carrier. The English word wand comes from the Old Norse, wander or valr, which means a staff. So she would have a staff, a personalized staff uh, or wand. When I say wand in English, you think of this tiny little stick that Harry Potter waves around. And it's not that, it's like a staff, a proper staff. And then they would have the long cloak. And that's basically what she needed and a few herbs in her pocket. But yeah. they didn't really brew potions and things like that. Now, did they have a relationship? These conduits, these Norse female shamans, kind of conduits to the spirit world, did they have any relationship with mushrooms? Yes and no, I would say. They did not use mushrooms to get into their trance. So let's look at what actually a vulva would do and how she carried out her magic, yeah. which is interesting. So they were wandering vulvas or valas, and they would wander from village to village and offer their services. And they were also like in the top part of society, along with the berserkers. They were very revered. So if you were a master vala or vulva, you would be treated very well when you come to a village. So yeah. the vulva she would organize something that's called seid, which means trans. Seid is a ritual where you call upon the spirits from the spirit world, who are the ones who guides and helps you and will give you information on things. So if the Volva would arrive to a town or a village, she would be given you know, somewhere to sleep, good food to eat, and she would ask the people of the village if they wanted to organize a seid. And if they wanted 
each household would send their most prominent female, you know, the most dominant female of the household. She would go to the Seid and they would sit in a ring around the vulva who would go into Seid, her trance. To go into a trance, she needed a drum, someone playing the drum, and she would use her wand, like her staff, and she would use, of course, her wisdom and powers to go into a trance. It was kind of frowned upon to use too many, how do you say, stuff to help you to go into a trance. That would make people a bit suspicious of you, because if you are a magician, you shouldn't need a lot of help you know from like magic brews and stuff so it wasn't based around entheogens and this is where it diverges a bit when you hear about other cultures even you think of ancient greek culture the oracle at delphi and how she would imbibe entheogens that would give her hallucinations that would let her so there's these deep traditions of the female mystic or the female witch or the female who would be able to tap into the spirit world see things that normal people wouldn't see but what's interesting to me is that the divergence of this Vala tradition, where it wasn't about the entheogen, it was about harnessing the power from within you, that the magic is known to come from within you and from within other women gathered in a circle. It's this acknowledgement that there is kind of communal energy that you can share and build up together. Yes. They would give her the strength that they needed because in, in old uh, Norse, folklore there is something called the haugen or the hugin which means your soul or your spirit Uh. or the astral plane and what you would do when you would say it is that you would call upon your haugen or your hogen we call it today in in modern swedish or hugin as we call in old norse you would call upon your soul and you would ask your soul to take you on like an astral trip. You would ask your soul to get in contact with whatever you wanted to speak to in the astral plane. You shouldn't need any herbs, you know, because the Haugen or Hugin is always there waiting for you. Well, it sounds like almost a modern interpretation of spirituality in some ways or or maybe i'm thinking of an eastern influence tradition where you have meditation and reaching your higher you know big s self that's out in the astral and that you can connect with it through meditation and you don't necessarily need an entheogen or you don't need something that's going to push you there and i love that are you really a good vala if you need herbs and mushrooms, can't you just meditate or do your sade and get in your trance and reach your higher self? I mean, that was frowned upon. I mean, the common folk, they might need help. But if you're a, a master witch, you shouldn't need... I mean, if you, just, if you need to drink some herbs, then anyone can do it. So she would use the power and experience from within because um, we have something in our old folklore called bashel, which means the, the ability to see what is not there. Like the movie The Shining, for example, by yeah. Stanley Kubrick. The first time they released it in Sweden, they translated the title to Vashen, because that means the ability to see or connect with spirit world. So if you were a human and you were born with this ability, that was good, because then you could become a shaman, you know, and it's believed to be passed on to your offspring. Does this show up in modern Swedish culture? Are there still people that you know believe in the Vashin and this tradition of the Valas? It might not look exactly the same as it did, but does this carry through to modern Swedish culture? There's still people doing same, but all, all this folklore, this mystical stuff I'm, I'm talking about, it's, it's very used in our common language still. I mean... If someone comes with you with bad news about the future, and it could even be your boss sending you an email telling you, these are bad times, we need to fire people. We call that a vashel because it means, you know, tidings about the future that may come true. So it's used in everyday language. Another interesting thing about this is, so I'm a vala and I'm doing the seid and I send out my hogen or my hugin to get tidings from the other world. Where I want these tidings to come from is my följa, 
the old Norse believed that every person who was born were assigned a guardian spirit. And this guardian spirit, it would like work as a team with other spirits. So when you're born, you get your warden, as we call it. And this is an English word that's been borrowed by English. As yeah, warden yeah. means guardian. So the warden will follow you. And the warden will give you tidings in normal daily life. And this tiding we call awning. You know, an awning means that, that's when you, you, go, you go like, stop, wait, I have, yeah. I've got an awning. That means like you, you get like some kind of clue about what's going on about something. So it's, it means like kind of like a tidings or something. The spirit responsible for this would be the warden. And the warden, he would, like, let's say, employ another spirit called the följa, which means the follower. This is the spirit that will follow you around. Because the warden, warden might go off on errands. He has to, to run do. spiritual errands for you. Yes. So there's a lesser spirit called the följan, filja in Old Norse, and it will follow you. And it will probably take the shape of an animal. The people believe that if they heard something and they turned around and they saw a crow or something right. or a fox, you would think that, oh, that was probably my felia who is just watching out for me. So that's kind of your spirit animal. The warden is like your guardian angel just finding analogs in our modern uh, American culture. Exactly, yeah. You have the guardian angel who's looking over you and then you have your spirit animal, which you just said mine is the fox. I believe in the fox. And it's kind of that thing where when you see – the fox or you you feel like you are kind of getting insights sometimes and i think what this most closely resembles in kind of the modern cosmology is the idea of synchronicity like you see in a moment something oh i know i get a meaning from that that no one else around me is getting right now that is telling me that i'm on the right path that i need to make this decision and we would say that oh I have an awning, you would say. Like, I, I have like a clue or notion or tiding about what I should do. And what they believed also was that if you were going to visit someone, your warden would go ahead and give the person you were visiting an awning. So they would have a feeling. So when you arrived, they would say, oh, I had a feeling you would come today. And you would say, oh, it's probably my warden. Wow. So, and did you know how they would find out what kind of följa you had? How do you figure out your spirit animal? Yeah. Yeah. When you are born, your family will take the placenta from your birth and they will put it out in the forest. Oh. And then they will wait and they will see what animal it will attract. The first animal that comes to eat from the placenta, that is your följa, your follower. That's an amazing tradition. That is incredible. So there is a definitive way to pick your spirit animal, and it happens at birth. Now, do some of these traditions of the warden, you're saying some of these show up in language, and, you still, and you're still using some of this terminology. It's intertwined into the fabric of your language, where there's kind of this mystical uh, appreciation or mystical legacy that's embedded right in the Swedish language. Yeah. I mean, I myself think it's so cool. When I grew up and I find out it's just normal things you say, and then you kind of realize that, oh, this is actually pretty well, awesome. And the word fulia, mm -hmm. I wonder if that has any relationship to the idea of a familiar. Uh, so when you look at some oh. other magical traditions, there's the idea of a familiar, which is like an animal or a spirit animal that follows around a mage or a witch or a wizard, is you have a familiar. So I wonder if those are somehow tied together. They could be. I mean, we have we have the concept of familiars as well, but they okay. are tied to Celtic witches. So ah. like the, the Velva, she would go into her sade, into her trance, and she would ask the wardens her own warden to come with tidings or the wardens of the women present. Right. You know, so if a woman wanted to ask something, you know, how will our crops be good? Will my son heal? The vulva, she would ask this specific woman's warden to come with a tiding, to like to talk to her. That's what yeah. she would do in the state. So she will come with with answers to things. So these are the spirits the vulva would contact. But those only. She didn't brew potions. 
she didn't do any of that things. We had other type of women doing that, like Urtagumma, and you know, they have lots of other names for those kind of women that would brew potions and things. And then you would have women who would do spells as well. Oh. The Völva, she, she wasn't that involved in spells. She could do spells, but that's usually not their focus. Yeah. But then you would have other kind of magic practitioners that would do spell. But they had to like draw their magic powers from somewhere else because humans don't usually have these magic powers. The Völva, you know, she can come in contact with the Warden and, and her Hogan and Följa because that every human was believed to have those other kind of magic which we're staring into here. They needed to be borrowed. And those we borrowed from another realm, the spirit realm. The Swedish word for wizard actually is called troll practitioner. Troll, troll practitioner. Man. Yeah, because this person, like Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings, when you read it, they will call him troll Karl, which means a man who consults the trolls. Like he would, they would borrow their magic from an external place. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and well, this gets us right into the realm of the Vasen. Yeah. This is this external universe. Interesting to parse these traditions out where that archetype of the wise woman or the witch or this magical woman would be the woman who makes the solves and the potions and also casts spells and also is able to get spiritual contact to see the future. So in Swedish culture, those are actually three distinct traditions. And it sounds like we've been talking about the Vala is more about tapping into innate human spiritual power. And now we're going to be talking about the magical yeah. realm with the powers of the trolls that a separate group of people would tap into to cast spells. Goodness, this is the best place to be <laughs> to talk about the, the concept of vasen, which means spirits. They are spelled with the letter A in our language, which is an A with two dots, which signifies that it should be pronounced more like A, but vasen. Vasen. Yeah. And this is also a word that's still used in modern Swedish. So vasen, it means spirit or collective spirits. When we talk about, let's say, school, and mm. we want to talk about like all the things that embodies school, the soul of the school, yeah. we say school vasen. And that means like all the spirits of the school, all the aspects of school. Oh, wow. So, we still use vasen in our language today to describe concepts or a collective well, mind or a collective spirit somehow. Exactly. It connotates collective energy. Yes. But if you only say vasen, then you mean spirits. And, and there's so many spirits that you don't only think about nature spirits. Still today, if you hear an unidentified sound from another room, as a Swede, you would say, what is this vasen? Which spirit is causing the sound? I mean, it's something that you just say. Yeah. And to signify something bad or evil in Swedish, you put an O in front of it. So, so noise, unidentified noise, the word for that in Swedish is uvasen, malevolent spirits. So if you hear like a noise, you don't know what it is. It was like uvasen, you will say. <laughs> uvasen. Yeah, which means like, noise caused by malevolent spirits so even um, today this idea of the mystical realm is very much at play in modern swedish culture and language even if people aren't cognizant that they're talking about the spirit realm when they say it or maybe they are there's this inexorable spiritual magical connection kind of interweaved in in swedish language goodness yes and you never mix like ghosts into this because ghosts are human spirits so they stay in our realm. So Vasen is not deceased spirits of humans, for example, because Vasen is a non-human thing. <laughs> and people today still will carry out some offerings. Like uh, in Scandinavia, we don't celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Yule. Yeah. And during the Yule, during midsummer and during Yule, the brightest time of year and the darkest time of year, because we're close to the, you know, we're in the Arctic region. So during the summers, the nights are very bright here. In midsummer is the day when the sun don't set. It's like the brightest day of the year. So what we believe is that the veil 
was it the veil or veil? The veil, Be- yep. The, the veil, veil behind yeah. the, the realms was thin, which meant it was a magical time. Yes. So during Midsummer, it was all the good spirits. And during Yule, it was the darker spirits. To protect yourself from darker spirits, there's so many things you would do during Yuletide. Oh my God, if you write a book about it. For example, you would be extra kind to the good spirits taking care of your house, to the house spirits. So now we enter the category of wardens, of caretakers, of protectors. And wardens, not your personal warden, but there are other warden spirits from the Vasen. Mm, exactly. I mean, I'm using the English word warden because yeah. you only have one. In Swedish, these two words would differentiate a bit. Right, right. So you know which ones I'm talking about. But in English, I don't know how to, how to categorize these. So it's the caretakers. And there you have our most beloved spirit, the tobte or the nisse, which is what the gnome is based on. Oh, little gnomes. Yes. So... They were humanoid in feature. You know how a gnome looked like. That's, of that's course. What they would, yeah, that's what they would look like. We so, love gnomes. Let's just call it a gnome because you have an English word for it. I mean, in, they differ a little bit, but the Tomte were the guardian spirits who would oversee your farm and your house and your crops. And they would work together with the humans. They were the most like important house deity you would have. Because you would have like an, an everyday relationship with them. Yeah. Because you know, on a farm, there's work every day. Everything has to run smoothly. For example, if, a, if an animal would fall sick, you would trust that the tomte would spiritually care for them. If it would be dead the next day or in a couple of days, you think that it was the tomte or the gnome who put it out of their misery. Because, you know, the gnome could see, does this animal have the potential to heal? You know, so if an animal would die quickly, you would think that, oh, this animal did not have a potential to heal. So our, our guardian spirit of the farm made sure that the animal got a quick death. So you would put out some offerings as a thank you to the gnome. Like that's the kind of relationship you would have. Yeah. But you also yeah. believe that the gnome could, could punish you in ways. If mm. you were mean to your animals, for example, your life could go downhill pretty soon. Or if you neglected your duties, that's the worst thing that Tonto did not like when you neglected your duties. They would make sure that like, bad things would happen to you personally. The gnomes valued fastidiousness, doing your duty. And when I'm hearing this story, I wonder if our tradition here, uh, maybe it's just an English and American tradition, is to put gnomes, uh, lawn gnomes, in your yard and around your house. And I wonder if some of that might be borrowed from Swedish tradition where the tomta were these gnomes that protected your home, if some of that comes out of that tradition. Because I don't know why we place gnomes in our lawn. And this would seem to give some kind of reason for that. Oh, yeah, must be. Because the be. word tomt in Swedish means plot or land. My land or my plot. And tomte is the spirit of that land because you are just borrowing the land from nature so along with that land comes the spirits which you have to work with you know you're in a team you and the spirit so it seems plausible of course that the garden gnome comes from that and this acknowledgement of spirits being tied to land and tied to place and being a vital part of life you see this show up in so many traditions around the world thinking of indonesia you know they leave out food for the spirits it's thought that you need to have someone staying in a house even when no one is there because you want to make sure that it keeps any bad spirits from taking up residence in the house so this acknowledgement of spirits and other worldly things embodied by the vasen uh, is just something we see across the world oh yes 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 it is it just takes on different forms depending on the place and the the, the culture and one big difference is the fact that you separate the spirits of the human dead out of that world. So that's an interesting differentiation where there is, this is more like the fairy realm where spirits that are totally separate from humans lay their domain. But what also stood out to me is this is also the realm of mushrooms. Yes. <laughs> now, how are mushrooms considered a magical spirit on the level of 
fairies or trolls or gnomes. I know, right? So how did that come to happen? No one quite knows, but the Scandinavians, they stayed clear of eating mushrooms for as long as like up in, into the 1800th century, people were still suspicious of eating the mushrooms just because they belonged to a different realm. Right. In many dialects, the word for mushroom was even like troll hat or troll foot just to like really really spell really, out how they were not a part of our world <laughs> really put you off you don't want to mess with the troll hats you don't want to mess with the troll feet so there's that idea that you just don't want to interact with them because they're from a magical realm and you never know what's going to happen if, if you mess with those things yeah and pre-christianity we had i mean Vasan was just, they were seen as like people, but just from another yeah. realm. So they weren't really that divided into evil and good. Like uh -huh. trolls, for example, you would ask trolls for help to, to lend you a hand because they were seen to be very powerful and they, you know, they lived inside rocks and mountains and things like that and could be very helpful if you needed strength and so on. But you respected them a lot. And after Christianity entered, anything that had to do with the spirit world became evil. Because what the Christians had a problem with was making people stop interacting with all the Vasan. Because people were putting out food for them, they were talking to them, yeah. offerings, you know, like you, you would even have like a board, trad, we call it. It's a, like you can plant a tree in your garden for the spirits to live in and you would pour milk and beer on the roots of these trees as an offering to the collective spirits of your garden. And the Christians were like, oh, how do we make them stop this? How do we? <laughs> <laughs> because they were like, look, look at our God and Jesus. And people were like, eh, nah, trolls. No. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what they had to do was that they had to like convince people that these spirits existed because they couldn't just make people unbelieve them you know so they right. had to make them evil so they were spreading these stories of like how a troll took someone you know how yeah. a troll would take babies how they, they had to come up with these big horror stories about each and all of these different fashion to convince people not to speak to them and come to church instead and talk to god i don't know if you've seen the viking churches the stave churches yes through your Instagram stories. Yeah. They managed to turn some of the Vikings during the Viking Age Christians. They would build churches. And the Scandinavian churches, they were, of course, built with wood. Because we use wood. We have, like, an abundance of wood. And we yeah. don't have the kind of rocks. We don't have, like, marble. We don't have limestone. We don't have those things that they have further down in Europe. So we use wood for everything. So we build these amazing wood churches, some which have still survived to today you know they're like a thousand years old it's so cool google like viking church or stay the church that's what they're called and are these the ones with no nails in them exactly yeah. no nails were Incredible. used because they didn't believe it was healthy for wood to be in contact with uh, iron oh. you know so because they it like rusts and then yeah. that will damage the wood okay. so it's made with wooden nails and each board were like numbered with runes. So you could take it apart or if a board was damaged, you knew which number to swap. They were very well planned out. Anyhow, the funny thing is the people who built this, the carpenters who built these, the state churches, they were ordinary, you know, Scandinavian people from the countryside. They asked the trolls to help them build the churches. Many of the most famous state churches today, well-written documents, lots of them, how, how the trolls helped out to build the churches. <laughs> and this was just how close people were to these things. And that's yeah. before the Christians managed to be like, no, don't go to the trolls for help. Come to the church. Ask God for help. They had a really hard time convincing people, you know, to ask God for help instead of asking the trolls, the tomte, the mountain roar the lake roar the like you know the elvor the elves people will go to these for advice this plays into how respected the vasan was so yeah. for example fairy rings as you call them in english it's a ring of mushrooms yeah where mushroom grows in the ring they are called elven dance or elven ring in 
Swedish because Elvor or Elven was one of the most respected vassen. They were like the highest. That's where we get the word elves. Exactly. It's borrowed from, from Old Norse. Even Tolkien brought this up because elves were something that we worship from the Stone Age. Like the first worship sites yeah. in Scandinavia, they were elven worship sites. And some ceremonies from the Stone Age have even like survived until today. Wow. And those are the elven worship. When you do elven blut or when you sacrifice something or give offerings to the elves. They integrated the elves into the, the Asa Tru as well. So the Valar, yeah. which is the people according to the, the Asa Tru, they were the elves, the highest of the highest uh, beings. They had like different hierarchies. We believe the nine realms and the high elves were like as far off as you can go. So they won't, wouldn't come here to talk to us. But the lesser elven spirits, the elvor, they could be seen in our realm sometimes. So they were the ones you would try to get a contact with. And they were believed to be responsible for the mushroom rings. So you can uh. see why, like, if you respect these vasen so much, of course you wouldn't go and mess with the mushrooms. I ascribed it to fear to don't touch those because we're afraid, but it may have also had a big part as the respect they had for their spiritual tradition and their relationship with these spirits that they don't want to mess with the mushrooms that are kind of the property of this realm. Other parts I'm picking up here is how tangible this tradition is. And I'm always struck by that when you look at any tradition based on an appreciation of spirits, especially the spirits of nature, how tangible and approachable it is and how you can have this intimate relationship with it because it is related to things you can see and touch. The idea that for the most part, the spiritual tradition was rooted in things you could see and touch and talk to. When you think of something like Christianity, where there's constantly kind of intermediaries, it has to be translated to you by someone else. I can see why the Scandinavian people were not willing to trade in their very approachable, integrated spirituality that was part of their life for a man they didn't know. And a question I had here was, did they see the Vasin, the creatures of the Vasin, these entities, as having a physical form? Or was it acknowledged that you wouldn't see a big troll or an elf, but they were strictly kind of energetic? or They were mostly ethereal. But sometimes you could catch a glimpse of them because they didn't mm. want to be seen by you. If you would sneak up on one, you might be able to see them. That depends on what kind of vasen it is. Some vasen, they don't want you to see them. A trolls especially, they don't like to be seen by people. You can hear them. That's what you believe. You can hear them or you could catch a glimpse of them. But trolls, our view of trolls, they, they don't look like in the Lord of the Rings, Rings movie. Troll had hair, long hair that they would braid. They would wear jewelry. They would wear clothes and they, their skin could be covered in lichens, like an old tree. Oh. But they had a lot of culture. Trolls had a lot of culture. They were not stupid. They would cook. They mm -hmm. would sew. They were very fond of jewelry. So they were very decorated. They would have lots of earrings. They would have lots of rings. They would have lots of uh, lots of braids, you know, and they yeah. would wear jewelry in their hair. If you were like missing a jewelry, you would think, "Oh no, a troll took it." <laughs> that, that's what you would say. You're ascribing more of a culture and like a higher society to some of these creatures that almost mirror human society. Do most of our conceptions of these kind of fantasy realm creatures that play out today in modern movies and modern books, it seems like we're borrowing almost all of them, whether it be trolls or elves, where the word sounds exactly the same, or fairies, or even things like werewolves, which are coming from these traditions of warriors wearing uh, oh, yeah. wolf skins. Are we borrowing all these things from Scandinavian culture, basically? So Tolkien the author of Lord of the Rings, the reason why he wrote Lord of the Rings was that he felt a profound sadness that England had lost all their folklore. Because there was a cleansing period after they were Christianed. They wanted to eradicate all the Celtic traditions and all the old folklore. It didn't rhyme well with the, the pure Christian faith. The Roman Empire never reached Scandinavia. They tried, they never made it through Denmark. You know, so we, we have never been colonized ever. We never belonged to another culture. So that's why our culture survived. 
Yeah. And our folklore survived and stayed intact, which it didn't in Germany and and the UK, for example. So Tolkien, he did a super good job with trying to like rebuild English folklore. That's what he wanted to do, and that's why he wrote Lord of the Rings. He wanted to give England folklore back. But in order to do that, he had to look at the countries around England. He looked at Ireland and he looked a lot at Scandinavia and Finland. If there were things here that he could pick up, that he could recycle, that he could uh, redesign in an English way and bring it back to England somehow. And he did a tremendously good job. His vision really manifested. Absolutely. And that folklore that Tolkien wrote about is the basis of so much other of the fantasy media and materials out there is based off Tolkien, which again is borrowing from Celtic, Scandinavian tradition. And I think that's why uh, Sweden and Scandinavian folklore stands out so much in my mind is probably because it was never colonized. It was never washed out in the annals of history by Rome or some other conquering nation. So you still have the roots of these spiritual traditions that are so vibrant and come through and then you can find hints of them elsewhere and it gives you this impression that the world was a lot more for lack of a better word was a lot more interesting in their <laughs> approach to spirituality and their worldview you know europe was probably a lot more uh, magical. I mean, there was a lot more of a sense Goodness, of yeah. of awe and wonder and mysticism that were present in all these different traditions, the understanding of relationship with otherworldly spirits. I love talking about Swedish mythologies. It feels like a touchstone to probably what was the real European spiritual tradition before Christianity kind of took it over and amalgamated everything you get a viewpoint into probably what European spiritual life w was like. And it's a world that I love. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like a little window where you can peek inside and be like, oh, this is, this is probably what it looked like. But And it still has a place today because we're still writing about elves, the elven, and we're still writing about, you know, like I said, maybe the law gnome that we have is associated with the, Tomita. Yeah. So yeah. these things still have a place uh, in our world. And that's what stood out so much when you were sending me information and talking about this. Going back to the mushroom. For us, like many mushrooms are associated with trolls. And I think it's because that's what in pre-Christian times, we, we thought that that's what the trolls were eating. So I think also out of respect, we wouldn't touch it. And after we were Christian and learned to like fear anything from the Vassan world. I think we also started to fear mushrooms because it was tied to the things we were now supposed to fear. Just to separate it, this is mushrooms with the classic stem and cap, but yes. Swedes did not have a fear of the bracket fungus. No, we didn't even call those mushrooms. As I said in the previous podcast, like language wise, we have a different word for the mushroom growing on the ground and the mushroom growing on the tree. The tree yeah. mushrooms called tikka in Swedish. And for us, that was, yeah, it was not, it was not a mushroom. It was, it was part of the tree. The Vikings have the same viewpoint on mushrooms in general as other folk did in terms of being in the realm of the Vasen. We've already dispelled the idea they were eating Amanita to go into Berserk, but did they have any relationship uh, with the mushroom? No, I don't think they did. Since they wanted to be like mighty, they wanted to have like, you know, good sailing luck, as we would say. You know, you want yeah. to be a good seafarer and uh, you wanted to find lots of good loot and things. Like they would look at things to worship that would grant you help with these kind of things. And mushrooms were not seen <laughs> in any way <laughs> to help with those kind of things. But I think that later in our history, when we had a lot of influences from Germany and England, you know, the Celtic influence, 
and we yeah. had like lesser witches, what we would call them, who would actually like brew potions and and actually make spells. They would turn to mushrooms because they would want the help from the trolls. Well, this is all fascinating. You know, I encourage us all to develop our own relationship with the Vasan and to go into that world and embrace the spirits of other creatures, but also the spirits of the land. This idea of the raw and the idea that pieces of land or geographical areas can have a spiritual energy all their own. What is the raw and then is this something that still comes up in modern Swedish culture? Can we find this anywhere in our culture today? Oh, yeah. So, rå or rådare, it comes from the word råda, which is rain, to rain over something. Ah, to yeah, be to the rule. Over, yeah, to rule, to be the, the counselor or the advisor. That word we use in Swedish still to ask for råd. Råd means advice. And rå means to care. And we, we still say that when you care about someone in a physical way, meaning you take care of them. Let's say they're sick. They need your help in any way. The same way that the, the spirit rå would take care of her land. They are the, the ruler or the advisor of a specific landscape or a particular location. And they are higher spirits, which means that they have a lot of power which means you definitely didn't want to piss them off in any way. <laughs> right, right. And two of the most notorious um, rådare that we still talk about today, and we even have festivals tied to one of these, is the forest rå, skogsrå, as we call it. She's a female rå who cares for the forest, or necken, which is a male rå, who is a river rå. Both of them are very beautiful if you ever catch a glimpse of them, you know, because she was the queen of the forest and he was like the king of the river. So Necken is one of our most still today, absolutely most popular basin. He's seen as a nude, beautiful man with long blonde hair. And he is sitting in the middle of the river playing a violin, a fiddle. He plays a beautiful tune of the fiddle. He was the vassan the fiddlers would go to, because just as Ireland, we have a, a huge fiddler culture. If you were an aspiring fiddler, you would go and give offerings to the Necken to get good at fiddling. Today, in some regions of Sweden, we still have like um, like a festival where a fiddler is chosen to be the Necken, and he will actually nude go out and sit in the middle of a river and play for a crowd. Because wow. nudity, nudity here is not, uh, that's also a thing, like that kind of the Christian purity didn't really get seeped in that much. I mean, we had a bit of it, but nudity here is not like a big so thing. So you weren't, it's, you it's weren't. It's not like a beautiful gift you give to someone that you show yourself naked. You know, it's just like, oh, you're naked or oh, whatever. And during midsummer, there's tradition here where you take the, the midnight dop, as we call it, the, the midnight dip. So at 12, you yeah. just rip your clothes off and you go skinny dipping. And even if you're with your friends or like their kids or whatever, everybody, because like nudity is not something sexual, it's just you without clothes. And my point with this is that here you see so many naked people, like from when you're a kid, you see yeah. so many different bodies. I think it's very body positive in a way because... Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like it. You're not taught to hate your own body or see nudity as something that's rude or vulgar, which kind of puts us in a weird relationship with our own body. Yeah, or sexual. Like if you see yeah. someone just being naked as something sexual, then you don't have like a relaxed relationship to a right. nude body. It's somehow scanned and valued in a way. But if it's just like, oh, you're nude, are you taking a swim? You know, oh, I just felt like being nude. Okay, or whatever. You know, if you have like a more lax relationship to it, you don't start judging it in a way. And this explains why our fiddler in the river example, why people aren't jumping into the river to go get this guy because they're not hypersexualized just by no. someone being nude. <laughs> exactly. And it's just like, so that's funny, funny tradition. 
So he's the most famous one, and then the forest Ro. She is the one who takes care of the forest. And there's so many stories of her. Goodness, each region has their own version of her. You know what she looks like, what she does. And hunters, it was very important for them to have a good relationship with her, because they went into the forest to hunt game. You would leave gifts out for her. You made sure that she knows that you're there. You would ask for permission. And the old-fashioned herding girls. Here, herding livestock was a woman's job, and especially young girls. So we have a whole culture about that. I've seen that, like kuning and things like that, have started to get popularized abroad as well, which is the the call of the herding girls. They have specific songs. I mean, they're super high pitched. It's kind of yelling, but it's very melodic and very haunting and beautiful. So. They, they did this to call each other because you would let the cattle free roam in the forest. And when you wanted them to come home at night, you yeah. would kula, as we call. They actually had a specific instrument made from tree bark called näverlur, which is a, like a super long trumpet. That's what it looked like, really slim. It's beautiful and it's very long. And it makes a specific noise, which the herding girls believed would ward off any evil spirits, any evil vassal. Oh. If you get a bad awning, you would honk in this trumpet. Your, your <laughs> warden or someone else's warden brought you a bad awning. You would have your trumpet ready. And it's yeah. just <laughs> incredible to see how this relationship with mythology and with folklore blended into the fabric of society in such a way where it was to a what I would think of as a positive effect. You know, we're talking about people who have a better relationship with their own bodies, people who are more in tuned with nature. And, you know, as we have kind of relegated folklore to the area of fiction in the modern world, I'm not sure that it serves us as much as having an appreciation for folklore as maybe something more than fiction or at least pulling out themes and lessons from folklore as something we can really apply in our lives. And by doing that, it's subtly influencing us to have positive effects like, like I just described, maybe a better relationship with ourselves, a better relationship with seeing spirituality all around us and really having a deep appreciation for nature. Uh, you know, sometimes she's a polarizing figure, but it might be no accident that uh, Greta Thunberg comes from a society like Sweden or Scandinavia, where there is this folklore, this appreciation of nature. And so she is here to be kind of a messenger of that. I like to tease out where all of these histories and folklores show up today, but I also like to see how it's influenced a people and had a positive effect on their collective psyche. And it's something that you know, maybe Tolkien was just getting started and kind of reviving an appreciation for this rich uh, European cultural tradition that really served a purpose. Even if you could say, oh, the Vassin isn't real, but maybe hearing those stories and developing some kind of belief system around that had another positive effect that, you know, if it wasn't literally the trolls, it was, hey, you're paying reverence to the forest around you. And this concept of raw, especially when I was reading the material on this, this is something that shows up more and more. Uh, if you read uh, Stephen Buhner's Plant Intelligence in the Imaginal Realms, he talks about more and more as science examines different individual pieces of nature, like a mushroom, like a tree, like a mountain. You start to realize that these things all exist in harmony together. This is called community ecology. Mm -hmm. And you start to see this greater area as an organism unto itself that's self-organizing and has all these individual life forms and things playing part. And it's almost like this tradition of believing in the raw gave you that sense of seeing things in that holistic way. And now, hundreds of years later, we're finally getting back to that. <laughs> Science has finally caught up, <laughs> caught up to that appreciation that was embedded in in Swedish folklore. So I love hearing about this tradition. I think it has such a relevance to today. Amen. That <laughs> sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on and talking about this with us. 
you know, in, in our last interview, you said, well, I have the advantage of just being the first Scandinavian person you've talked to. And that's, and that's true. But I think you do have a really good knowledge of this stuff, a really great perspective you can bring to bear and you live it. So there's no better person to, to talk about it. So I really Thank appreciate you. I actually have to add that when I moved to my first apartment, uh, when I was 17, I moved out of my parents' house to, to be closer to school. I moved into the city and for years after moving into an apartment, I would still put out gifts for my, my tomte, my house deity. I had to really think about it at first because I was like, I'm in an apartment. I must have a house deity. Because in Swedish tradition, still to put out gifts for them. Like at Yule, you will put out a bowl of porridge, for example for the tomte like it's like we leave we leave food for saint nicholas yeah it comes from that yeah like straight from from our tradition of doing it because like santa claus in our language is tomten tomte oh he's just a tomte yeah here we had during yule we had the tradition of um the yule goat which means your farm deity he would go and get the yule goat who had all the gifts for people who had treated the farm good oh you know they okay. you know they would give back to you for having been such a decent person during that yeah. year so that's an old tradition we had here santa claus for us is just tomten it's just another tomta just a bigger one <laughs> He's just a big tomta. <laughs> yeah so when i moved into my apartment i was thought long and hard about like of course i must have a house deity Yes, I must. So I would put out food like uh, once a month. I would put food in my kitchen in a specific little altar that I had like for the house deity. And I, I did that for years. It was just some years ago that I stopped doing it for some reason. It's still there for many of us, these traditions. Is part of your spiritual tradition or any spiritual practice based upon understandings like Warden or like Haugen, do those stay still play a role do you consider yourself a vala or i feel like as i grow older i yeah. will probably start practicing said or something like it i still feel yeah. a bit too young for some reason i do believe that i have a warden and i will sometimes talk to it and ask it things and ask it to send me like an awning about something <laughs> or i will definitely definitely try you know, if you want someone to reply to you or get yes. back to you. And I mean, yeah. like my friends or my, my partner or my sister or something, I will be like, tell her, tell her to the warden, go and tell her, make Work. her feel that way. Like when you feel like someone is behind you or you feel like someone wants to talk to you, that's why when we believe that there's the warden doing that. So I sometimes feel like, go, go and tell her. So she'll call me back. <laughs> It, like we always talk about, you'll think about someone and then you'll suddenly get a phone call. That's actually the warden delivering an awning for that person. And then the phone yeah, call exactly. comes through. And do you have your Access. own, do you have your own fulia? Oh, my fulia. Fulia. Yes. Yeah, my fulia. I've heard that it can change shape during the years because mm. it somehow it reflects your character. And if you change character, your folia can change its shape because uh -huh. it's supposed to represent you. But for years, I believe it was a crow. Sometimes when I walked in the forest, I would hear a crow call. Uh, you know, they have so many calls, crows. They have such oh, they're huge insanely variety. insanely intelligent, yeah. Yeah, so you, I would hear this specific call and I felt like it was following me. That was this is years ago. So I just decided that that must be my folia because that's what it means. Folia means follow your yeah, follower. Yeah, they're following you. Yeah. So I still think I have a mischievous crow. <laughs> well, after this, what about you? After this podcast, you're gonna look out the window and see a crow. For me, it's a fox. I'll ascribe it to like fox logos or symbols, or you'll have times where I'm even just scrolling through like social media and there will be an advertisement with a fox or a little post with a fox will pop up as the first one. Oh. And that'll be my awning yeah, to say, yeah, ah, like whatever I was thinking about right then or whatever I was planning to do, that's a sign that, okay, this is the right 
this is the right thing to do. And it's come yeah, at definitely. and it's and it's come at times, like you said, with an awning where you know that like this isn't just by chance. One time I was flipping through a stack of papers. Uh, I was doing you know, office work and I was flipping through a stack of papers and I was having thoughts about at the time, you know, is this the right place for me to be? Should I be somewhere else? Should I do something else? And I had stopped flipping through the papers and at the top corner of one of the papers was like mm -hmm. some company called Fox with a little Fox logo on it. Why would I stop there right when I'm having these big kind of thoughts about changing my life? Um, so it'll show up for me in ways like that. Ooh, yeah, that's a clear sign. I find a lot of my own pseudo spiritual or spiritual beliefs put into words by some of the things, the things you've been bringing up. Oh, that, that's awesome. And another thing that was, has always been big in Norse mythology is dreams. You get messages through your dreams. Like one of the biggest midsummer rituals that people still very much do here is that you pick seven flowers on the midsummer night during the night where the sun does don't set and you put them under your pillow and you sleep on them and you will get an awning in your dream you will dream about your future and preferably the kind of married life you will have maybe you will dream about the person you will meet who you will marry or you will have some kind of prophetic dream right. about your future family life and they, they believed also that your Thulia or your warden would show themselves to you in their dreams with messages. They would be disguised, but you could feel it. When you wake up the next day, you could feel it. Ah, oh, I had a message. Dreams were a very important part of every person's life. They're putting you in contact with some of these spiritual beings that you may not be able to directly speak to in your day-to-day -day life. Now, because this is the Mushroom Hour, has uh, have people's opinions of mushrooms changed or has this general spiritual understanding of the Vasan and things like that changed to integrate mushrooms as mushroom foraging has become more popular and people have become less scared of classic mushrooms like uh, porcini and chanterelle has the spiritual traditions changed a little bit to better integrate them oh it definitely has since people have such a positive relationship to mushrooms now i mean here it's like you actually kind of like almost worship mushrooms. Anything with a, like a mushroom pattern or print on it, the mushroom itself is very present in our lives. It's become a little deity on its own. I people, think a lot of mushroom lovers feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But people will still say, and I will say that too. I mean, sometimes I really want to write it on my Instagram when I post a picture of a mushroom. I want to say trolskt which means troll presence. You, you can look at the other person you're with and you'll say, doesn't it feel trollsked? And they'll be like, yeah, I, just, I also just felt it. It means like the presence of the other realm. And it's something people will still say sometimes when they see a, like a grove or a part of the forest where there's a lot of different mushrooms, you will say, oh, trollsked. Because you can kind of feel the presence of the other realm when you see them. Nowadays, it's not something bad or something that you should fear or stay out of now it's almost sought after like you're like oh it's the other realm you know <laughs> yeah we're, we're touching the vasin by being around the forest full of mushrooms we're connected right now to the vasin the veil is thin yeah. i think people really miss that feeling suddenly yeah. people are like they're reaching out for it you want to be in contact with the other realms Absolutely. I think we all want a little more contact with the other ethereal realms in our lives. Yeah, and the mushroom will now suddenly help you. It's a the portal. The mushroom will take of. you there. In that way, it's definitely changed. It's a positive portal now. Well, that's the best place I could pick to wrap things up. Everyone, mushrooms are our positive portal into the Vasan and the magical realm where we can interact with trolls and elves and commune with them and then also understand our own power outside of the Vasan. I mean, this has been an amazing journey that you've taken us on here, Saga Maria. I just thank you so much for taking the time and really putting in the research and bringing me up to speed and giving us all the amazing Swedish translations uh, so we don't have to listen to me try to say these things. I really appreciate it. Uh, I had a great time. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>